time, Dr. Freeman? Is it really that time again? It's been 20 years, and the effect these games had on the gaming industry is immense and everlasting. I was five years old when I played Half-Life for the first time. These games are timeless. No matter how much time passes or how older I get, the enjoyment I get from these games every time I go back never declines. As time passes, the core game remains the same. When I first played these games, I didn't understand why they were so revolutionary, and as more time passed and I grew older, I realized why and how these games changed the gaming industry. Although, in recent years, Valve has sadly taken the easy route with their business model, switching over to a market-based system, taking funds off all video game purchases on their platform. They're not the company they once were, and I don't know if we'll ever see a sequel to these games, or any other of their critically acclaimed games. However, the memories of these games, and the excitement to see what Gordon's next installment brings, is still as present as ever. November 19th, 1998. The year the gaming industry arguably received its biggest game changer. No pun intended. Players were met with a very different setting than what was marketed. You immediately step into the shoes of Dr. Freeman, a physicist riding a tram through the Black Mesa Research Facility. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. The game's slow, almost somber pacing and atmosphere led an entirely new persona of the game, one never shown through marketing. Players soon realized the environmental storytelling the game gave, which led to a new medium in how video game stories were presented. Hey Mr. Freeman, I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago and I'm still trying to find my files. Just one of those days, I guess. They were having my a problem. Hey, what are that. you doing? Come on, Gordon. You trying to get me into trouble? The scientists also talk and often foreshadow events later in the game. Exponential cascade scenario we discussed. My God, what are you doing? Ah, Gordon, here you are. Bruh. We just sent the sample down to the test chamber. In the test chamber. Within the first 20 or so minutes of gameplay, it had completely subverted the player's expectations. However, this subversion was used to heighten the impact of the sudden catastrophe known as the Resonance Cascade. I will admit that the possibility of a Resonance Cascade scenario is extremely unlikely. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. We've assured the administrator that nothing will go wrong. Ah, yes, you're right. Gordon, we have complete confidence in you. Oh, yeah. The Resonance Cascade shattered the aforementioned atmosphere of the game, leaving players unable to predict the future of this game's story. Although the Cascade was the tragedy of Black Mesa, it was also a gift to gamers and creators alike. This game's success in technologically advancing video games echoed throughout many years to come, birthing multiple sequels to the game, such as Blue Shift and Opposing Force. It even inspired modders to create their own ideas utilizing the Golden Source engine, and thus Counter-Strike was born. What was once a mod inspired by Half-Life is now one of the biggest esports games in the industry. Half-Life was an achievement that resonated within many creators. It inspired them and allowed them to broaden their own creative spirits. November 16th, 2004. Once again, the gaming industry is graced with a revolutionary sequel that often holds up to today's standards. Half-Life 2 is a direct sequel, taking place right after the first game's ending events. This installment brings forth a whole new physics system that I've yet to see any other games utilize. It allowed for whole new ways to engage in combat and tons of new puzzles. There's no limitation on the complexity of those interactions. Right from the get-go, the game establishes a huge sense of anxiousness within the player by presenting the Combine as a totalitarian force. The city scanners created a sense of paranoia in which you felt each action you took was recorded. 
In the first five minutes of stepping off the train, the game has already well established that the Combine is humanity's biggest threat. Not only did they dominate the Earth in only seven hours, but they also managed to compose a suppression field that prevents human procreation. And did I mention the water? Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. I don't even remember how I got here. The game perfectly instills you with a sense of fear, but also the urge to fight back. As you go on, the game's narrative often changes, plunging you into completely different areas, and despite how different they are, the level design is almost seamless. Through the canals, to Station 7, Black Mesa East, Ravenholm, Highway 17, despite player choice being limited to the game's predetermined story, it truly feels like an adventure. We now have direct confirmation of a disruptor in our midst, one who has acquired an almost messianic reputation in the minds of certain citizens. His figure is synonymous with the darkest urges of instinct, ignorance, and decay. Some of the worst excesses of the Black Mesa incident have been laid directly at his feet, and yet unsophisticated minds continue to imbue him with romantic power, giving him such dangerous poetic labels as the one free man, the opener of the way. I've heard some people complain about how the gunplay pretty much remained the same from Half-Life 1 while the AI's intelligence was downgraded. For example, in Half-Life 1 the enemies would use wind-up attacks that you had to continually dodge. It kept you on the move and helped the combat stay fast-paced. Whereas in Half-Life 2, the enemies are pretty straightforward, not really coordinating with one another. You can keep the fast momentum if you like, but it's really not as necessary as it was in the original. The tone of the combat was definitely shifted, but I personally enjoy Half-Life 2's combat more. Humans were beat down into submission by the Combine, and Gordon was in stasis for 20 years. In a lot of ways, this is a redemption story in response to the Combine. Therefore, I feel the slower and more straightforward combat represented the narrative a lot better. This was one of the first games on the Source engine, debatably one of the most flexible engines of all time. The in-game physics were dynamic, and each player had their own unique way of traversing a level. Each character's design and colors represented them and their unique mentalities. There's nothing Gordon can't handle, with the impossible exception of you. The addition of no cutscenes enforced the importance of dialogue and helped the player understand the subtle details of the story. On the topic of this game's subtlety, you view the story from the eyes of Gordon Freeman, a silent protagonist. Gordon Freeman's knowledge of the world is as limited as the player learns. His silence prevents confusing topics to be questioned. Therefore, it's left up to the player to piece things together. If you take time, you can find so many hidden details. A quick example in Black Mesa East, you can find a newspaper detailing the Seven Hour War. The war resulted in humans being segregated into controlled cities while others were tested on in Nova Prospect. This crucial piece of information was never directly told to the player. That's what makes Half-Life great, it doesn't use exposition or cutscenes to present the story. It uses its world and all of its hidden details. As I'm sure we've all heard so many praise this game for what it did right, I digress. Overall, I feel as if the presence of these games raised the standard for storytelling and world building. Myself and many others often yearn for a video game story of this fidelity, and often we never receive. The addition of Valve and their games changed the rules of gaming, and presented a service and platform for all of us. Half-Life 2 was the first game in which Steam was required. So who's to say we'd still have Steam if Half-Life 2 never saw the light of day? The year of Half-Life 2 was also the year of many other amazing games, such as Halo 2, Far Cry, Battlefront, MGS3, or even Counter-Strike Source, which was also a Valve game. As great as those games were, Half-Life was something else entirely. The entire industry fundamentally shifted with the release of that demo. Everybody in the, the, the gamer side and the creator side all had their brains collectively flipped. It was the they live moment where Rowdy Rowdy Piper's putting the glasses on and seeing the science, right? That is truly how I felt, going, oh, this is how games can be. All we can hope for is that Gaben crawls out of his hibernation and learns how to count to three so that gaming can once again be revolutionized. Just say three. Three kills, triple, three heroes. Three. But what's my motivation? But unfortunately, that probably won't happen. 
These analytical videos, or video essays, or whatever you call them, are so much fun to make, and helpful for me in creating a basis for my channel's content. As we wait for Gaben, I'm currently producing an SFM short in the universe of Half-Life 2. For any of you hardcore fans interested, here's a link on screen. Thanks for watching.